With us today, we have Dr. Bobby Ivanoff, Professor of Integrated Strategic Communication at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Ivanoff studies strategic message design, consumer behavior, and strategic communications. His theoretical work is on the study of inoculation theory, which is what we'll be discussing today. Dr. Ivanoff, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me here. I'm glad to be here. I look forward to it. Thank you. Let's start off by talking about the basics of inoculation theory. We've learned that inoculation is based on presenting threat followed by refutational preemption. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely, certainly. Well, the idea of inoculation theory is tied to the analogy of biomedical inoculation, which can be used to help prevent certain diseases by injecting weakened strains of the virus into individuals, people. The intrusion created by these weakened viruses is designed to shock the immune system into producing an immune response in the form of antibodies intended to counter the intruding agents. So think about it, or think of it as attitudinal inoculation that works in much the same way as inoculation messages are designed to, pro to provide a shock value to the system. And this shock value is intended to motivate individuals to defend their attitudes, but I'm using attitudes here very liberally. This could refer to beliefs, opinions, stances, positions, values, anything such, behaviors. Uh, so they are designed to shock the organism into generating defenses for these attitudes. So now more to your specific questions about you know, the process of inoculation. Uh, think about it as the shock value is generally delivered through two main mechanisms, or I should say components of the inoculation message, the components the inoculation message actually uh, carries. The first is what we call an explicit forewarning. And this explicit forewarning is used to directly inform message recipients of the vulnerability of their attitudes and the high likelihood of facing potentially um, attacks against the attitude attitude in place. On the other hand, the refutational preemption component initially is designed to deliver weakened kind of arguments or counter, I should say, counter attitudinal arguments used to implicitly deliver the threat by exposing individuals to samples of arguments that they are likely to face. Uh, this ends up rendering the threat real. So these kind of arguments in similar fashion to biomedical interventions, if you will, are designed to be strong enough to motivate the body to, to generate protection, but not so strong as to overwhelm the very attitude it's actually designed to defend. So the refutational preemption then proceeds to refute these weakened kind of arguments presented on the other side of the issue. And as such provides defenses for an individual to shore up the attitudes in place but also it helps providing by providing some counter arguing practice by showing individuals how they can engage in this defense of, of the attitudes. It provides them some material that actually can use in the defense of the attitude and pro potentially just as importantly, if not even more importantly, provides them with the motivation to generate these defenses to engage in this uh, attitudinal defense. Therefore, inoculation messages are designed to elicit resistance process, the resistance process that reflects the engagement or motivation, uh, the threat component that motivates the productions of counter arguments that in turn end up generating resistance, thus providing protection uh, against attitudinal change. So in general terms, that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of the, the inoculation process. Do you feel that any of the political developments over the last five years or so have increased an in interest in this field of study in inoculation? I would think so. Uh, one of the things that we have seen with the political, uh, the, the changes in the political landscape is more of a polarization of attitudes where individuals are getting more and more divided and they end up listening to more and more to what others individuals have to say. So how do you combat those? And it's, it's not an easy process. We actually have talked a little bit about and, and looked at this uh, with some colleagues considering a, a future um, 
projects. We even have started uh, the first part of what we call agent-based modelings in which we're trying to play with different variables to see if we can kind of chip away from these polarizations where parties and, and uh, you know, individuals are becoming more and more polarized by trying to go after the reasons potentially for, for this polarization. So when we're looking at from inoculation perspective is how do we go after these? So there is, a, there is a rational way of doing so for individuals who are maybe becoming more polarized but for all the um, right information, meaning they may be getting um, information that's, well, when I say for the right information, they are doing it based on the information they're receiving rather than based on emotional decisions. And these decisions may be because they are only exposing themselves to um, information that confirms their current standing. So that's what's part of the confirmation bias. But they are exposing themselves to uh, rational information that they assimilate in their current understanding of the event. So a, a more rational based inoculation message is designed to kind of combat all of these uh, opinions. But the issue is sometimes we're having trouble with, you know, people are not always rational and then don't always kind of um, uh, open themselves for information that's presented in this type of setting. So how can we deliver messages that may go beyond this rational account? Uh, we have inoculation does develop and can use emotions, although it has to be done carefully in, in messages. So one of our more uh, studies, more recent studies, and I say more recent now, it's been six, seven years since, since we published that study, but showed that we can point out to individuals the effect that these type of thinking and, and selective exposure may have on their effects. Uh, and we can also point out how um, the information that's provided by potential political candidates, pundits, or individuals associated with just one side, side potentially one side of the issue, they present them or put individuals in almost a lack of choice situation. You either vote for us or you're with us, or you are on the wrong side of the issue. We are, if you want uh, for this issue to be resolved, we're the only individuals that can do that. That's providing them with that almost false choice and suggesting that this is the only way that it can be done. So what the inoculation messages we have learned we can do with those is point out through the message that this is, it's not a lack of choice situation, that actually the, the messages and the messengers from the other side of the issue presenting these choices are limiting their freedom to actually make the decisions for themselves to self-determine. And we were able to show uh, to a degree that by pointing that out and ourselves not suggesting that uh, anything other than the choice is yours and allowing them to make those choices that individuals have actually shown to uh, some anger and negative uh, reactions against those messengers and messages when they felt that those freedoms to make those decisions by themselves are they're being uh, taken for granted or more importantly here they're being limited so in these situations we have seen some success and certainly it's, it's something that can be translated or brought into the political milieu You've written about a blanket of protection that inoculates people against related topics. Can you get into that a little bit, explain what you mean? Yeah, so, so it's important also to, when we're thinking about inoculation messages and how we use inoculation messages, there is always the fear of, great, so you identify two to three arguments in your message, maybe even it's a single argument. And we do that for a reason, because the messages can only be so long before they become unrealistic. Actually, uh, what we have done much more lately and uh, presently as well, we're trying to get those shorter to be used in a shortened format, yet still retaining most of the inoculation components, all of the inoculation components. Theoretically, they can work, they should work. We argued in the, in the, in the chapter that you referenced earlier, we've argued uh, in other chapters as well, but we're still working on showing evidence that that is the case or finding out ourselves whether that is the case. So in reality, we can only use so many arguments. Most messages use two to three counter arguments that they proceed to refute. Well, it's unlikely that these uh, counter arguments, although they may be the strongest ones presented, which is why we're using them to refute those first, there are other kind of arguments that we cannot attend to in inoculation messages. So the fear is always, okay, if 
the messages work only because you were able to refute the specific arguments that people see later on, then any effectiveness of messages would have is limited. It's only limited in situations in which you can show that you know, you've kind of captured all the arguments or there's only limited one or two arguments. In all the other situations, once you get beyond those first two, three arguments, now what happens? Now what do you do? And the originator, McGuire, uh, who provided or who came up with the theory or proposed the theory, was one of the first to recognize this and, and test to see why are the messages effective? And can the messages be extended to arguments that you have not seen before uh, refuted in the original message? And what he was able to show over and over again is, was when the attack messages carried the content that was previously refuted or completely novel or different content, they were just as effective. Uh, Banners and Reigns had a, a meta-analysis that they did in, in 2010 in which they were able to show on a larger scale that this indeed holds true. And that provides us with much greater confidence and utility in using inoculation messages because the idea is that it is not the content itself that generates the efficacy of inoculation. Uh, in some, uh, some sense, yes, it does. I mean, when you have specific arguments, they have, you have great evidence of how to refute them, that certainly helps. But that cannot be all of it. Otherwise, we should not see the same effectiveness when novel attacks are provided. So the conclusion is in this situation, it is the motivation and the practice that individuals engage in in that kind of arguing the defense building that is uh, the reason for the, the effectiveness or the efficacy that we see with inoculation messages. So generally individuals get three components. They get the message as a, um, you know, get some arguments, some content they can use, but they also get practice. They're provided with a guided practice of how to engage, engage in this practice, as well as provided with motivation to build up their uh, defenses. Because when we hear our uh, attitudes being potentially challenged, we don't sit idly, not in today's world. Uh, we ask others, we talk to friends, uh, relatives, we jump on a social media or jump on the internet to try and figure out why is this the case? What do we don't know? So we engage in this defense building and that is what provides our ability to be effective in pro protecting our attitudes within uh, on our attitudes on any arguments that are related to that context or to that specific attitude. And that is what we call cre the creation of some call it umbrella protection or blanket of protection or any of those attitudes that are related to that specific topic. So um, that's kind of what we mean by blanket of protection that inoculation uh, attitudes are defensible, not just against specific uh, issues you've accounted before or arguments you've accounted before, but noble ones as well. And have you seen inoculation being used in any new and interesting ways that get you excited about the future of the research? Yes. From a theoretical perspective, what's most exciting for us is this um, new venture into the therapeutic area, being able to use inoculation not just as a resistance, but also a strategy to generate change and strategy to, um, you know, move individuals from neutral uh, to shape attitudes as well. But another in area that's, that's been really exciting for us is the realization, I think we always have thought about that, but never allowed, that inoculation is not in the kind of arguing process that happens. This defense building is not just a uh, something that occurs in our minds, uh, that incurs uh, interpers intrapersonally, but it's a process that actually occurs interpersonally as well, that we do talk to others. And that's part of exciting research moving forward. Okay, what does it mean? The limited research that we have done with, we know that once we have been inoculated, that we talk to others. To reassure myself, so I may talk to like-minded others to kind of feel like my attitudes and beliefs are indeed correct because those were just shaken with the threat component of the inoculation message. So they talk to like-minded others in, for these purposes, but they also talk to others who sh do not share the belief because now they feel efficacious enough that they can advocate their beliefs. They have the arguments that they want to share. They have the practice and they engage others in those conversations. So we know that these actually end up strengthening their, uh, the conviction with which they're holding these beliefs. What we don't know is what happens to the others who receive these messages. Does it have a positive impact on them? If it has positive impact on them, what does it, what does it mean from there? 
Do they share it with others? How many others do they share it with? How does that inoculation transmit or diffuse through these social networks? And how far can it go? We also can have a scenario in which uh, an individual may not be convinced, but ends up still sharing the information with others and have a positive inf influence to others on others. So even though they did not receive any direct impact from the inoculation message, they were a conduit of transmission to others for whom it did have an effect. We actually have uh, uh, at least one study now in progress that's looking at this potential social network of uh, transmission of inoculation messages. So think about what kind of effect this may have in real situations let's say during disasters, whether it's brush fires or whether it's uh, hurricanes in which individuals have limited access to technology. Maybe their TVs off, their, their uh, cell phones are off. They've been for days now, they cannot charge those cell phones or just uh, all the satellites are down. How do you transmit important messages in, in this situation, including inoculation messages? Well, if inoculation messages can be transmitted via social networks, that's another way of getting the messages to the final consumers or to the individuals, even though they did not directly receive the message. In earlier studies, we, we thought unless they're directly exposed to the original message, they don't get inoculated. We're learning that that may not be the case. They may get indirect inoculation. Now, how strong that is, how effective, that's an exciting part that we're going forward with. Is inoculation considered currently the best method to protect attitudes in place? Yeah, I believe that there are two real theories that look from a persuasion and communication perspective that, that are most closely associated with um, resistance. And those are re a theory of, of uh, psychological reactance and inoculation theory. If you look at the persuasion handbooks, and I think, or any of the persuasion books that are used in our discipline or just in general, you will see usually only inoculation theory and uh, theory of psychological reactance or just short reactance being listed. The difference between the two theories is that generally when we look at psychological reactance, we're looking at it as an impediment, as something we need to overcome to make sure that our strategies are effective because they may prevent our effectiveness. And that is goes to the example I was giving before to the, the individuals feeling like their freedoms are being restricted. When we word our messages, we have to be careful not for individuals to feel like we're giving them commands or restricting their freedoms because they may boomerang. They may react against it. So how do we overcome that? So when we're thinking about reactance, we're generally thinking in terms of how do we overcome it? Re uh, inoculation is the only theory that's consistently shows up in all of these literatures that's actually designed to um, encourage resistance, to actually bolster resistance. So as such, it's uh, the only theory that you will see uh, in that regard that's consistently used and referenced. And uh, that's why it's also been so popular and also been very frequently referenced. Okay, looks like we're out of time for today. We've been talking with Dr. Bobby Ivanov, Professor of Integrated Strategic Communication at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Ivanov, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. It was my pleasure.